strategy to cut blue collar jobs for years. And now they're targeting their white collar workers, too. As these businesses tap into tech, their innovation doesn't always translate into job creation. So the big question here is, should workers be fearful of the future? Is technology leading to more unemployment? Joining us to discuss this in our Google Hangout, we have Federico Pistono. He's author of Robots Will Steal Your Job, but that's OK. We also have Professor Lawrence uh, Kotlikoff, who works for the economics department at Boston University. We have Peter Schiff. He is the CEO of Euro Pacific Capital. And we have Roy Cohen, career coach and author of The Wall Street Professional's Survival Guide. And on the phone, we have Christine Lindner. She is a member of a family that owns Lepo's Ridgeview Dairy Farm. I want to thank all of you, but I'm going to start with you, Peter. Are the robots really taking our jobs? Is this really what we should be worried about right now? Well, hopefully they'll take some of the jobs. I mean, that's what's the, the good thing about automation and technology. Look, there's a lot to worry about, but progress is not one of them. Uh, machines and tools make us more productive. They don't destroy jobs. They liberate labor to pursue other things. I mean, that's the whole idea. The goal of life is to work less and to enjoy more. We want more consumer goods. We want more leisure. We want a higher standard of living. And we achieve that uh, with productivity, uh, with automation, with technology. Technology. This has been going on now for hundreds of years, and we've had these arguments uh, in the past that, oh, we should fear these machines. You know, look at all the people with shovels, the bulldozers put out of work. But, you know, we're better off because we can build with bulldozers. We're better off not having to have all those guys uh, using shovels. And to the extent that we can get computers to do more sophisticated things, to replace more jobs, to free up humans, uh, to pursue other areas, uh, the more the better, because we'll all enjoy a higher standard of living as a result. But what's at stake? I mean, there are times where, you know, I can appreciate technological development for the common good, even if it means some shrinking jobs. For example, I travel back and forth uh, to New York from Philadelphia all the time and vice versa. And for years, I would hold on to the toll booth route and I'd pay my two or three or ten dollars to the toll booth operator primarily to save jobs. And then at some point I just said, you know, I can't wait an hour every single day uh, in line, you know, for, to pay a toll when I can just use Easy Pass. And at some point, the technology uh, became more important to me than the job, I must admit. But then there are times where I'm like, you know what, I can actually wait in the supermarket line an extra 10 minutes as opposed to having these electronic checkouts. You know, I don't need technology in this case. I'm being a little bit lazy and I'm killing well, 10 jobs by wanting to be able to check out But what about the jobs that are destroyed because you're wasting your time? You're less productive. If you're more efficient, if you spend less time waiting in line, you have more time to do something else and jobs will be created in other parts of the economy and we will all, we will all benefit from that. I, I hear you. Uh, I don't know, though, uh, Professor. I worry about this. Professor Kotlikoff, I, I understand that jobs will always open up somewhere else. I'm not a complete Luddite. You know, this isn't like the Industrial Revolution where I'm worried that, you know, if I, I must destroy the machines to prevent, you know, the loss of employment. But at the same time, if I kill, if I kill 10 toll booth jobs for an easy pass, I'm not sure where those jobs pop up on the other end. I'm not sure either. And I think uh, what you're hearing from Peter is a copious use of the word we. Uh, what he's really uh, saying is that he's going to be better off, uh, but not necessarily. He's, he's not really saying that uh, uh, other people will be better off. Uh, he thinks they will be, but there's a lot of evidence that the distribution of income and wealth has gotten much more skewed, that the wages of young people compared to middle-aged people uh, have gone down, and a lot of young people are less skilled than middle-aged people, so they would be replaced more by these machines. And then you have the impact over time of young people not having wages from which they can save and help uh, invest in the economy. And that has a knock-on effect through time. So when we write down models of this technological change, we can find at least mathematical models that are pretty straight, you know, straightforward that show that society can actually be made worse off or in the future. And even output can go down because of the dynamics of saving and investment. And, uh, uh, and so it's it's got to be... Uh, I mean, Peter's right that everybody can be made better off if we manage this process carefully, but we have to do that, and we have to be aware of what's going on. Talk, let, me pause you, let me pause you for a minute, Professor, because you, you said something that's important that I don't want us to zoom past because it, it could be a deal breaker here. You said that there are mathematical models, there are statistical models, there, there are data that show that society gets worse. Can you be a little more specific? I don't want you to get into the weeds here, but help me understand like, what evidence do we have that societies get worse? 
Well, you know, economists are able to write down lots of models. I mean, uh, so I don't want to say that this is uh, absolute reality, but I, I wrote a paper recently with Jeff Sachs. It's gotten some attention. It's, uh, it's called Smart Machines and Misery uh, and Long-Term misery, misery because you can write down pretty straightforward models of machines substituting directly for people, and that leads to uh, younger people being really who are unskilled being uh, hurt, and then they're unable to save as much as they would otherwise. And then when they're older, uh, when they're supposed to have wealth to hire the next set of young people, they don't have as much wealth and they don't have as much capital. And the next set of young people don't have as much tools to work with. So even though the technology is better, there's less capital accumulation and you can actually have uh, future generations be worse off. But this is just one very stylized uh, model that's gotten some attention but it just shows you the potential for problems and i don't disagree with peter that there's uh and we also show in the paper that if you, you have to have very active government policy to redistribute to, to make sure everybody's a, a winner that it's a win-win i think the free market is the best way to make sure that everybody wins when the government's in charge their friends win and well, you know it's not the wealthy people that benefit from automation it, it's the, it's the average person that is that, that benefits from lower costs. Hey, Peter, wealthy Peter, people can, Peter, can, can afford to overpay for. No, for I, I, I don't I don't want to get too far into the sort of free market fundamentalist argument or the challenge of the free market fundamentalist argument. We can do that a little bit later, but I want to bring in someone else before we, we go there, and that is Christine, because Christine is somebody who actually does this on the ground. Christine, your family and its farm have had to wrestle with this technology. Uh, debate. You've had to deal with this reality on the ground. So what have you guys done with regard to technology on a dairy farm? What we've done with our family dairy farm is added robotic milking technology. We went uh, a year ago from 60 cows milking to 120 cows. So we've doubled our herd size without adding any additional labor. And so fundamentally on a dairy farm, the task is milking the cows. And now that we've been able to remove that physical labor of 16-hour days milking cows, we are now able to offer more freedom and flexibility to our lifestyle while still actually growing our herd and increasing milk production to produce a quality product. So for you, at a lower price. Well, so for yeah. you, te so for you, technology has been actually a benefit. You've been able to get the best of both worlds. I'm hearing you say that you're able to and have more leisure, but you're also able to grow your business, that life is actually better with this technology as opposed to what some would have argued, which is that the technology will kill the farmer. Correct. This technology has been revolutionary to our family and our farm. In Wisconsin, there's about 150 farms out of 12,000 dairy farms that are currently using robotic milking technology, again, a way to automate the industry, and that's exciting for us in agriculture. Yeah. But, but that is, also benefits her customers who now can buy cheaper milk and now they have more uh, uh, money for other things, creating jobs in other areas of the economy. Here's, what about here's all my the concern, farm hands. Here's my concern. Uh, what about uh, the farm hands that have just been laid off? And they're going to do something off. else. Yeah. Well, like, hey, what? it's a vibrant economy. Jobs are fluid. They want to be Cap made. Labor will okay. seek its highest use. Oh, okay. okay. oh, this is fascinating. No, let's talk about this because this is fascinating. And this is actually the point I was going to ask Christina. Christina, I'd like you to answer. And then, Professor, I want you guys to jump in. And Roy, please jump on in as well. Please. Um, yeah, please. Chris, Christine, you have technology that is making cow milking easier. So because cow milking is easier, you guys can get more uh, cows. You can get more work done. Your life is great. I get that. But what happens when the technology gets so good that you guys aren't needed anymore, that people don't need farmers anymore, that the technology gets so awesome that people sort of bypass you guys and suddenly cows are getting milked and milk is getting sold and suddenly your family's work is no longer necessary? People will be needed regardless. Certainly we build it and we don't walk away from the operation. That's essential. But what it's done is fundamentally that physical task of milking cows is now removed and it offers us more flexibility and freedom to go to a wedding or a family event where in the past we've never been able to get away for that. And that's something that is a challenge for agriculture and farms and family operations. So this technology is offers us tremendous flexibility and freedom. But you have, and, and you have no worry. Taking care of our cows. Mark, may but, I jump in? It's Roy Cohen. Yeah, please, Roy, please jump in. And, and I approach this from the point of view of a career coach because I see this on a, a daily basis with many of my clients, and I work with a lot of clients on Wall Street. Uh, technology uh, and changes as a result of technology are inevitable. Uh, that's how our, our economy is, has evolved over generations and, and hundreds of years. 
and we can't fight it. We have to accept it and embrace it. What we need to do is make every effort to stay ahead of the curve. And when you don't stay ahead of the curve, you fall behind. Is it our responsibility as employers, um, as governments, to uh, protect people because they haven't done everything they need to do to stay current? And um, change is inevitable. I, I, yeah, and, 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 and Roy, change is inevitable, and that means that some things become obsolete. I understand. Well, look, Mark, let me give you an example. Uh, what, 150 years ago, how did we get around by horse and buggy? Uh, nowadays, there's uh, talk about driverless uh, uh, vehicles. So the fact is that we still need transportation. The way we move is changing. So we can't fight change. What we have to do is figure out how to respond to that change so that we can remain viable, so that we can remain uh, uh, employable in an economy, in a market that's changing. So what does, so what does it, because I, I push back against Christine's idea that they'll always be needed. If technology keeps growing, it's possible that there will be a technology that could actually take care of the cows and herd the cows as well uh, without, human, without human involvement. So just take this to, the, to its logical extreme here. If that were the case, what does the farmer do to not become obsolete? Well, other than... I guess what I'm saying is at some point, it could be possible that this awesome technology that's helping them milk their cows become so awesome that their job is no longer needed. And so, yes, I see how on the top end, you know, you can, you can morph in the guy who was once a, a, an, an awesome uh, data entry person can do something else, or someone who was a great computer programmer can, can, can sort of morph with the technology. Now they're doing HTML when before they were doing, you know, DOS and basic programming. I get that. I could see how, you know, the, the, the job uh, of someone who was uh, working uh, at high-end mail delivery shifts with the internet and now they're doing online uh, d delivery services. I get how high-end stuff can morph easily because t typically people with wealth and means have the, the resources to get professional development, to grow, to change. But what happens Actually, to the... Actually, the, the, real, the real challenge, Mark, is not at the top or the bottom. It's at the middle. And those, are the, folks who are, those are the folks who are most challenged by change. Yeah. How so? Uh, because they've uh, embraced a lifestyle. They have mortgages. They have uh, uh, kids in school. Uh, they have expenses that uh, uh, force them to, uh, uh, to earn a certain level of income, and that creates yeah. tremendous stress and fear for those individuals. Federico, yeah. help me understand here. You say the robots are, are, are taking our jobs. Is that good or yes. bad? <laughs> well, it's a double sword, and a lot of many of the things that my colleagues have said are correct, uh, but I think there are two fundamental problems. Um, in the, one is, as Peter said, I'm sorry, um, Federico. We, we're having a tech, we're having a technical problem right now with your audio. I'm going to have my producer link up with you so we can get audio. I just want to point out that 30 years ago, no, I, I, 30 years ago, we would just use a telephone, and an operator would I answer, can. and we'd connect, and we wouldn't have this technical problem. But this extraordinary technology <laughs> is compromising our conversation right now. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to you, though, Professor, as we fix Federico's uh, stuff. Talk to me about uh, about this point, though, because I'm, I'm not sure I've gotten an answer yet. Isn't it possible that technology can become so ex extraordinarily efficient and effective that it places people out of the job market? And for people who have low-skilled labor, I don't, I don't get what else they can do. If, if suddenly there's a technology that, that sweeps floors and, and does janitorial duties, it's not like I, the janitor's going to say, oh, well, I'll just become a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the use of the word we here, we just have to do this, we just have to do this. This is going to be all, great for all of us. That's just uh, really silly because you know, I was driven... Uh, to, uh, I'm actually in, Lon in London, I was driven to uh, Oxford by a guy who lost his welding job to a machine, and now we're learning he's, gonna about, he's about to lose his driving job to a machine uh, when the Google you know, driverless cars come along. And this guy's entire life will be damaged by this, and no government has, is going to redistribute and make it perfect for him or redo it. Uh, so he may be able to go work for Peter uh, as a menial servant or something, but his life is going to be a series of, of calamities uh, due to this technology. Now, I'm not saying we sh I'm not a Luddite that we should get rid of this stuff. We can't do that. That's not going to happen. But we have to start actively thinking at the government level about uh, redistributing in a way that actually protects people and make sure that everybody shares in this uh, technological... Go, go, go back and look at the oh, American oh, experience I, in the 19th century. Hold on you one know, second, we Peter. Created... Let me jump back in here. Go ahead, Roy. 
Uh, I, most governments, the Department of Labor, for, by state by state, offer training programs that individuals can participate in. So if you are ambitious and motivated, you can learn new skills so that you can become, uh, so that you can transition into a job, into a career that may be um, uh, more secure. So it's up to the individual to assume like some our- responsibility. That's like gardening for Peter. Is that is that the new career? <laughs> That's like what I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> let, let, gardening for Peter, the let, welder, who's yeah. now the driver, who's now going to be the gardener. He's yeah, going to go. Well, for, why not? Uh, what's uh, what's uh, wrong with that? It's it's an honorable profession. Let me give you the example of America in the 19th century. We had the Industrial Revolution. We had no government policy. Government was tiny. We had capitalism and automation, and we created the middle class. People from all around the world were coming to America because of our automation and our industry and our innovation. We weren't destroying jobs. We were creating wealth and creating productivity. And you have to remember that a job is not a an ends. It's a means to an ends. What people want are consumer goods. They want to be able to consume more things, and they have to work to do it. But to the extent that we can consume more and work less, look, if I can have a robot replace me so that I, I didn't have to be here right now, I didn't have to run my companies or do my job, I can let my robot do it for me, and I can spend all my time, you know, sailing my boat or, or, or well, spending time with my way? family. Hey, that'd be better. Way? I'd be better off. Peter, let's start you out with no boat, no money, and you have no job, except you can be my gardener. How are you going to well, feel about that your whole life? You know, well, why would I want to be your gardener my whole life? Why, 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 why can't I strive for something better than that? that that's, a, that's an interesting point that Peter brings up, and a comment comes in from Fluke, who basically asks a similar question. He says, do people want to stay secretaries and switchboard operators, or they want to become innovators, creators, thinkers, yeah. and centerpieces instead of the slave. Hey, you know, I, I guess the, my question is, Peter, out of work. Second, you don't Peter. even need a secretary anymore. You, you got a smartphone and a laptop computer. No, but, I, but the point, Peter, I think is that the question presumes, and even your comment presumes, that people who are at these low-end jobs are, are so because of a lack of ambition and desire. If, well, you're, if you're at the low end of the, of the totem pole with regard to employment, it, it, oftentimes if your job gets eliminated, you don't have access to other jobs or the get, training look, to get There will there. be other jobs and they'll actually be more productive. And if prices keep falling because of innovation, people will make more money. You know, there's always gonna be low-end jobs, but under a free market system with innovation, the lower-end jobs are more and more lucrative in terms of the purchasing power that they deliver uh, to, to the worker. We're getting some feedback from one of you guys. We'll have to mute that, but Federico, I think you're coming in. Yeah, can you hear me now? You got you, brother. Okay. So, um, I agree with Mr. said, but I think we are not considering two things. Well, Peter said that, Peter, Pete rightly said that as he increased productivity and automation, we should be working less. We haven't. We work just as much as we did in the 1960s and sometimes more. And that's because we have a lot of perspective. We don't know why we are working. And many because of the jobs that we do. We have bigger government. We have to pay all these taxes. Many of the jobs that we do do not produce any value in our society, but they're just there for the sake of species consumption and keep continuing the cycle of labor for income. Income survival. Yeah. I know some and there are a lot of people who don't and work at all now. They I know that some, oh, really, really fast, Peter. Hold on, Peter. Peter, 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 give me a second. Peter, hold on. Just uh, for the sake, I know we're having some audio problems, but we're really committed to having Federico being heard. I wanted to make sure that everyone who uh, couldn't hear understood his point. He was saying that the argument is that somehow automation is going to reduce our workload, make us uh, more uh, able to engage in leisure. But he says since the 1960s, we've actually had more work we've done more labor, and that has actually done the opposite of what it purports to do. And he's all, he also said that uh, it, that suggests that somehow this is more about conspicuous consumption and expanding capitalism than it is about actually making our lives easier, our lives more livable, or our jobs more manageable. But go ahead. That's uh, not true. I, I'm not saying it is or it isn't, I'm just translating. Yeah, as a human try being, to, try not to as a machine. Try to imagine doing your jobs today without all this technology, without all the computers, it would be immeasurably harder I mean, we, we probably, there's, the only reason we can afford this huge social welfare state, this gigantic government, is because we have this technology. If we were forced to operate with the technology, let's say, in the 1950s, the economy would have already imploded. We, can't, we couldn't afford all, all, all this government. Peter, nobody is questioning that. What I'm saying is, you've said it yourself, since we've increased productivity, we should more leisure time. 
we don't. We work just as much as 50 years ago, yeah. if but not, that's not because more. of the technology. And, and there's plenty. Remember, there are plenty of people that don't work at all. There are people who okay. are living off of government no, checks. Please. They don't have a job. They don't yeah, work I, one hour a day. Right, but but Peter, if, if, if we buy, if, if, if we assume, Peter, if we buy into your argument and say, all right, there are people who aren't working at all, and then we shrink job, and, and then we shrink the labor market further by creating technology that replaces those jobs, and the jobs that are required to service that technology obviously are smaller. For example, it takes fewer people to work at Amazon.com than it does to work in a bookstore. It takes fewer people to manage uh, an, uh, uh, an email system than it is the labor to. Market. What shrinks the labor market are government rules and regulations that okay. encourage so, people not to work and then punish yeah, I mean, employers from hiring people. That's what shrinks the labor market, Roy, not automation, not um, progress. Uh, Roy, talk Mark, to me. You, you raised a very interesting point. You said uh, uh, technology has eliminated the, bar, the bar, Barnes and Nobles and the borders. Um, Amazon has expanded. Uh, so have the distribution systems to support Amazon. So we've got delivery, uh, uh, all sorts of mecha warehousing, all sorts of functions that support an expanded um, internet-based business. So when we remove uh, jobs from one sector, we create jobs in another. It's just repurposing individuals so that they're able to operate in a new environment. Absolutely, but just to extend the example further, I would argue that the number of jobs lost at, ch at the tens of thousands of chain bookstores that, exists, that existed are not, were not all relocated within the internet distribution phase. The oh, the warehouses are absolutely right. So, jo so, yeah. so with the technology, there were fewer jobs. Yes, people could have left their mom and pop bookstore or left the Barnes and Noble and, and formed an online bookstore. Yes, they could have uh, become part of the Amazon team doing something or other. But the fact of the matter is, Amazon runs an efficient model, and economic efficiency means that that profit margins are high, that that waste is cut. And in this case, waste is those extra jobs. And so there are just so always by destroying something? machines. Can you can get rid something? of all your appliances. See can how I much extra something? housework you have. Guys, can I, can I jump in? Sure. OK. Look, you can write down models, Peter. You're not an economist, and it's pretty clear. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know how you're more of an economist than I am. OK. Let him finish. You can write down models with no government, with perfect competition, where the advent of the of particular types of machines and to, and uh, the way they come on board makes everybody worse off over time. Okay, it's immiserating. Now that's not the problem of the government. That has to do with the technology and the fact that. And then you need the government actually to redistribute to make everybody better off. <laughs> it makes everybody worse off. Well, you're not you're not following. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, what I'm saying. Yeah, I am. You, you think everything's the government's fault. But the fact of the matter is we're having a big change in the income distribution, and it has something to do with these machines. No, it doesn't. Competition with foreigners and uh, offshoring. And we haven't uh, really addressed this uh, in terms of government policy. You think we have, but I don't think we have. Well, no, government policy is the reason we have these problems. Sorry, may I just for a second? Frederick, I'm going to give you the last word, and then I'm going to read some comments. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So the first word, the last of us. And that's the reason we are not experiencing uh, less late, I mean, um, used work. We actually have the same work we did before. And the second problem is pace of automation is speeding up exponentially. So compare what happened 20 years ago or 10 years ago or 5 years ago is very myopic or almost relevant because machine intelligence is increasingly at an exponential rate, which is very counterintuitive to because we think linearly. So if you actually look at the future, you'll see that companies that create a lot of value and they make a lot of money, they employ very few people. So technology, as it advances, it employs lesser and lesser people, and it creates much more value than it did before. And in my book, I have examples of this. If you okay. take the multi-billion dollar company started from the 1950s, they were employing 250, 300,000 people. Now Facebook, fifty billion dollars, a hundred million dollars worth of violation, three thousand people employed, and it's only going to get worse okay. unless we change. One, one second, Federico. We're still struggling with your audio. It's, it's, we're still struggling with your audio. We're, we're working on it very much. So, uh, we have comments coming in. Rock People says, with regard to my point about bookstores, that's not totally true. Amazon Marketplace uses U.S. postal system, primary for delivery. Yes, Rock Peoples, that is true. 
the post office is strengthened by Amazon or the, the marketplace, but the broader technology of the internet has essentially killed the U.S. Postal Service because why? People send emails instead of letters. So at the end of the day, the broader artifice of, of technology called the internet and the, and the web and digital media have all killed the job known, the, known as the post office. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that we should all resist this and write uh, handwritten letters with quill pens to one another as opposed to sending an email. I get the benefit of technology, but there are times where the efficiency and the benefit that we get from it do not outweigh or outstrip the, the downfall on the labor side. And that's there all I'm no saying. There are no such times. That, 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 there that's a times. fantasy. There are those times. There are these times. No, no, there aren't. Well, well that was that, right. that. There, was, there that are was, problems. I, I love you, the analytic richness. I have a, a, an econ professor like, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Hold on. I have some more comments coming in, guys. You look at uh, low wages and unemployment, and you assume it's because of technology. It's got nothing to do with technology. When we had the industrial well, revolution, we, we didn't true, have okay? any unemployment. You can say whatever you want, but it doesn't make it true. Okay, you can just make these statements. I wish no, I was well, no, I, I, I speak the truth. Everything. That's what that's what I've always done. But surely, this, Peter, I mean, Peter, it's, it's somewhat about your economic this models all you want. These are the okay. same models that said there was no housing bubble that caused people to, to pay no. par for no, no, you know, no, no, subprime mortgages. Models. I was out there criticizing these models. In real Actually, time. Peter, I Peter, was Peter, 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 economists failed to do. I would put, was hold on, Peter, the 2008 financial crisis. Crisis. Peter, I, I would push back on that. I would actually argue that that politicians didn't follow economic models sufficiently. And that's why we ended up in. In these economic uh, no, no, down no, cycles, but hey, but there's some I, comments I coming in that I want to read. We have Split man, Black coming in. Facts. Hold on one second. Split Black says Peter is right. That's right. Tech is better no matter what. <laughs> sure, there will be pitfalls, but everything is now in the transition phase, and we will have to adapt. We have another one coming in from Professor JT who says we all want technology to make our jobs easier. We really can't be mad if that technology becomes our job, but still, we'd rather have a person helping with our situations and not a robot like talking to a bank or business like Amazon online. That raises another question here, uh, gentlemen, and that is not just the economic piece of this, but the cultural piece of this. You know, I've, I've written a lot about books and bookstores in particular. And look, I order Amazon every chance I get. I am uh, guilty. I, I help destroy borders. I buy about 100 books a month and I, between 50 and 100 books a month, and I order them mostly from Amazon. But I think there's something cultural about sitting in a bookstore. There's something uh, cultural about people coming together in a common place and discussing ideas or sipping a cup of coffee as they read a news. I mean, it seems to me that the, the, the part of what we generate politically, culturally, socially comes in certain spaces and technology can kill that part of us, which to your logic, Peter, could ultimately kill creativity and innovation. But Mark, well, look, don't you it, feel that that's been replaced it, by environments like Starbucks and other uh, community-based uh, uh, experiences? No, I, I don't, actually. I mean, I, I think that there are dimensions of Starbucks uh, that do that, but because of the Starbucksification of places like New York, where you can't go seven square feet without a Starbucks, we're also, because everybody wants to be efficient and fast, it's not a place of community gathering and thinking anymore. There Certainly not still, the way bookstore is. There are still plenty of bookstores out there. They haven't all gone out of business. I've been in them. My books are there. They have, people are there uh, reading, sitting on couches, drinking coffee. If you want that experience, it's still available. If there's demand They're shrinking for it, rapidly, the free sir. market will provide it. That's what, that's what capitalism does. It satisfies demands of of consumers. That's businessmen are looking to make a profit and they're going to give the consumer what they want. If nobody wants that experience, then it won't be there. But as long as people sure. desire it, Peter, entrepreneurs will figure out a way of providing it. Matt, so just imagine this. Uh, how long does it take to adjust to a instance? Google is a trillion dollar business. Dozens of millions of people, not dozens of millions of people, work in the automobile industry. That could be automated from creation of the automobile to the transportation to the driving itself. Now tell me, a 50 year old truck driver, how likely is he to become a computer software engineer or a biotechnology, a biotechnology expert or a, um, no, a, a nanotechnology engineer in the five to 10 years? in which this, this whole business will be automated entirely. Now tell me, how is that 50 truck driver going to adjust? That's a great question, and we're going to continue to wrestle with this. It seems to me that the condition of the truck driver 
Uh, some of us are saying the truck driver will find another job. Maybe he'll become a brain surgeon. Others are saying that <laughs> maybe there is no job he coming up. He'll become a brain surgeon, but there will be other jobs for him to do. What <laughs> part of the theater? The, the production line created jobs. It didn't destroy them. Henry Ford yeah, invented but, 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 that. Well, Peter, you can't it. honestly compare an industrial revolution where things like motors and engines and cars were produced to what happens at a checkout line at, at the local fresh grocer where suddenly 10 checkout cashiers are being replaced by an automated machine. Yeah, you may, the level you of technological advance is not... Lines. You may want to wait in a long line for a toll booth. I just assume zip on through uh, with the easy path. No, I hear you, Peter. Sure. Look, Peter, <laughs> I hear you on that. But what I'm saying is, is that you 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 your examples put tolls on every road that way we can create lots of jobs no that's not what, what i'm saying, saying either you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're taking here's my point peter and i know we got to run but what i'm saying is that i we all no one here is against technology look i'm on huffpost live clearly i like technology the point is that certain forms of technology are necessary for a societal advancement. And so when you point to the Industrial Revolution, these are moments where major shifts happen technologically that allowed us to exist in the modern world. Yes, that is not the, hold on, that, hold on, Peter, hold on, Peter, hold on. That is not the same as somebody being able to get a bottle of, 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 of Maalox and, and, and check out on their glazed ham 10 seconds earlier. That, that to me is not the same level of economic or, or technological necessity. The That's the point. Applies. Well, the, the if, 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 if we didn't destroy jobs with our automation and technology in the past, we're not going to destroy them. No, although what we do is we destroy some type of jobs, but we free up labor to do other kinds of jobs. All right. And we're more you productive. We have a higher standard, standard of living. We've come full circle here. I think we all are, I think <laughs> we've all agreed to disagree, but we've had a great conversation. I'm going to conclude. I'm going to I'm going to wrap with the, one more comment coming in from Space Pilot, who says, spoiler alert. One of the current guests is actually a robot. I am. This is true. I won't say who it is. It's Federico. But one of them is a robot. Anyway, thanks for watching HuffPost Live. Federico, Professor, Peter, Roy, Christine on the phone. Thank you so, 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 so much. You've all been awesome. Up next is someone who knows his way around a robot. Ricky's coming up.